people the same amount. And please talk about the market as a community. And I'm wondering, you know, we think of Ballard and Cool, and we think of communities. Did people at the time, as you saw it, see the market as a community in itself? Did you personally see well, that? How did that work with your publicity or what your job You know, there, there really was a... Um, separation between the friends of the market and the people in the market, not that we intended it to be, but we did not get acquainted with the people who, who uh, worked here and lived here, but as, as much as we should have. Um, and, and certainly there was a community here. Um, some of the uh, stories that uh, they shared with each other and the triumphs and the sorrows that they shared with each other were really startling. Uh, one, one man had uh, been rendered impotent in a camp in Germany and had had his potency restored and they had a baby. And this was, this was a big cause of celebration in the, in the whole market uh, community. Yes, of course they were a community. Yes. So in this sense... But uh, most people in those days, you didn't talk about things like that. And um, most people couldn't uh, really relate to that kind of a story. So it, it was a tight situation, yeah. See, yeah. those yeah, this people were very much with each other and uh, for each other. Did you, um, as members, what were some of the Loved them to death, all the alive. And just, yeah, uh, we were we were really at odds with Bob Ashley, of course, during a good part of this, because he had, you know, a completely different concept. Uh, he came. Victor um, felt that he couldn't carry the whole burden. He said, "I've got to have help on this." And Bob Ashley came along and said, "Okay, he would be the co-chairman." And uh, he was co-chairman for a while before we realized that, you know, there really was a conflict. Uh, Joe Scherzen was uh, allied with uh, Bob's faction, if you want to call it a faction. I guess it got to be a real war. And uh, y you have to really look on it as, you know, totally different concepts. It's not, uh, they were incompatible. How so? What were the differences of vision? Oh, well, the... Uh, as I, I said before, the, uh, there was the yuppie fight idea. Bob had uh, come from the East, from Boston. He'd seen lovely Faneuil Hall the, that uh, Benjamin Thompson designed. And uh, he was, uh, what do I say, conservative? No, he, he wanted things to be completed. The, uh, you know, that's a nice, complete arrangement if you have nice, clean buildings and <laughs> nice, clean this and that. To the rest of us, this was a work in progress. Still is. Still is. You know, and, and there just wasn't any way that we could agree with each other on these two totally opposite concepts. An idea of sort of yuppie shops. You know, have you been to uh, well, New York? Well, such as the Fulton Fish Dock in New York. Yes. Another yes. Mall. That, it's it's nice, you know, but it is another mall, as you say. Yeah. Yeah. Quite. So, uh, fortunately, our uh, people prevailed. Uh, for, fortunately, the city said, "This is what we want." And, uh, I was thrilled when the <laughs> What kind of, how did you all celebrate? I wasn't here for the uh, celebration, isn't that sad? No, no, I had left, yeah. Do you come down to the market now? Uh, this is the first time I've been, I've, I've uh, just moved back to Seattle from New York after 25 years. Oh, you're a good 
tradition to talk about seeing something after 25 years? How does it look different than you would, you would expect after all that? Time? Looks just like it did. <laughs> Looks the same. Yeah, a little more extensive. I've been here a few times, and a uh, little more um, uh, ethnic variety, which is fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, these are the opportunities that we wanted to have open, and they are. Did you expect to have as many condominiums and people living downtown as there are now? No, no. <laughs> That's a shock. <laughs> That's a shock. But, uh, you know, other cities are doing this, too. Uh, New York now has a blooming farmer's market in Union Square, and, of course, they think they originated the idea. <laughs> and in Harlem, there's a, a market that's similar to this. They swept all the uh, people who were selling stuff on the street into a market area. Some of those people have started their own businesses now. And, you know, the... Yeah, these things happen. These things happen. Yeah. Yeah. What memories when you look back? Is there any particular stories that you can recall, or maybe something funny or unexpected that, that you can share with us? Oh, I don't know. I think, I think the whole thing was pretty unexpected. <laughs> no, I can't think of anything right now. Do you think there is anything about the time that this occurred? Well, it had started 10 years before, you know, it wasn't uh, 1971. Yeah. 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 I, I was remembering a party when you were asking me uh, that um, we gave, um, we were so pleased with the uh, marvelous publicity that everyone had given us that we decided to have a party just to say thank you. So uh, I called uh, Angelo. Pellegrini and said, you know, we're going to have a party. Could you help us plan it? Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> he came roaring down to the market, and we had a party, I think, for 400 people that cost something like $16.22. Angela went around to see all his friends in the market, <laughs> and they all said, oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a marvelous party. He had a great time. Jack Corsaw had, there was a Jack Corsaw, do you remember? Um, he was an artist, wild man. He had a huge apartment here, and uh, he had, he was furious. We used his apartment, which was a marvelous place for free, but someone poured a drink in his goldfish tank, <laughs> and he couldn't believe that anybody could be such a beast. <laughs> The, his girlfriend's kids revived the goldfish by <laughs> mouth to mouth resuscitation. They blew on them <laughs> with straws. <laughs> well, we used to get weird things going on. <laughs> there was another time when uh, someone just spontaneously started dancing or playing music in the market, and there was a man who was. Uh, standing there with a briefcase and, and drumming on it with a, uh, I think he had a ruler in his hand. He was drumming away and drumming away and drumming away. And all of a sudden, the bottle in the briefcase broke <laughs> and trickled. Everything went trickling down. Yeah. I think I'm lost, though, as far as any more are concerned. It's been a long time, and I'm an old lady. No, give me a break. Um, how was Angela? Let me ask you a question. He wasn't a member of the committee, but uh, he, he was so beloved in the uh, community, in the Italian community particularly, that uh, he was just automatically included in everything. We weren't, we weren't terribly formal about all of this, you know. And uh, so all we had to do was say, hey, Angelo, <laughs> he'd be down here, you know. He'd, of course, he was violently in favor of keeping the market. You know, I mean, this was, oh, yes. You know, oh, yeah, this was life and breath and food. Yeah. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. To somebody the spirit that still takes them to his mind. It's fine, fine food. He's celebrating. Oh, yeah. Oh, how he loved it. How he loved it. Yeah. This was on your life. Well, I certainly enjoyed this. Thank you. Good, good times. Wasn't it just fun to think about how energy people get together on a cause and you find out how much energy people have? Yeah, you know, it's so much of it was spontaneous.
but this is our opportunity to find out about people's you know need for the market and the involvement that uh, you may have had with the original estate in the market and you know your memory for that time for your ongoing participation and involvement in the market change. Well, I was 14 the year that I worked on the initiative to help save the market. But I knew then that it was an important thing to do. Um, the Pike Place Market is uh, such a big part of the Seattle experience, whether you live here in the city or you're visiting. And to think that we may have lost it at one time is just unimaginable to me now. That's an unusual thing for a 14-year-old person to be coming to your restaurant in, in a such capacity that you work in the I would come downtown with a friend of mine, and uh, particularly on weekends, and we would solicit signatures. So, um, yes, it was it was an interesting experience at that age and in the 70s too. Um, but I really, I think it was important, and I think that it shaped the involvement that I have today in various activities. I live here in Seattle still, and I don't come to the market as frequently as I would like to. But when I do, I'm, I'm still struck by the memories of that time. And the changes that have taken place have been exciting, and yet it's retained uh, its personality. I'm very proud of that. What are some of the changes that you see from the time that you were collecting signatures in the future now? What are some of the changes? Well, so much has changed. Um, obviously, people and times, but uh, the businesses that have come and gone, you see all of that, and, and some of it is, is not really clear in my mind because it happens gradually, but we have all seen it, and, uh, and yet the personality of the market is still very much intact. I think that's the most important thing that comes through to me. Do you remember, did you actually collect your signatures right around the vicinity of the market at the time? Pretty much, yes, in the, just very close in the downtown area here and in the market area. And uh, most people were very supportive of it, as I remember it. But we occasionally encountered people that, um, that were not. And at that age, it was, it was um, difficult to deal with. But it gave me like, a lot of experience, I think, in that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm involved with animal rights today and, um, and have, in fact, just this summer been working on Initiative 665. And um, I thought a lot about my experiences that year collecting signatures for the market, so. What were some of the arguments against saving the market? Do you remember at the time of some of the reasons that people didn't think it should be saved? Well, again, I was young, so mm -hmm. I, I just remember that um, a lot of business people, um, you know, they wanted something bigger, better. It was sort of a time of urban renewal, and um, I think that they just, um, they didn't really see the value um, to the market and how, how important it was to, to preserve that history. Do you, um, do you bring people here to, uh, to your dramatic time? Oh, certainly. So what are it's some of the different perceptions that, people, that you've heard of people maybe who aren't from Seattle? Oh, I think people are overwhelmed by the sights and the sounds. There's just always so much going on down here at the market and the smells of food and, and of course there's this spectacular view to be afforded. Um, yes, everyone is very impressed by the market. And you still, um, you say you come when you do. What are some mm -hmm. of the things that you particularly, what are your favorite parts of the market? Oh, I love to, to see the street musicians and, uh, and just stroll around and, and look at the beautiful artwork that people produce, the, the vendors, and uh, just a little bit of everything. I think that's what it's all about, is it, it offers just so many things that every time you come to the market, it's a different experience. Do you, um, do you have children that you bring? No, I don't. It's interesting no. to see different ages of people, how they respond to this kind yes. of invitation. And what, Absolutely. Um, what do you think is the future of the market? What do you see 20, 30 years from now? Well, I've thought about that. Um, I'm not sure. I, I know there will be changes again, just yeah. as there have been in the last 25 years. But I'm optimistic that, um, given what's what's been done and what's been retained, that we'll just continue down that that path. Yeah. 
I think people realize now that that we could never allow the market to be threatened as it once was. And as the structures need reinforcement or whatever needs it may have down the road, I would certainly hope that we will all work to, to continue the preservation. Are you familiar with some of the agencies in the market or the community or the market itself that it serves? Um, not particularly. I do know there's a lot of things going on down here, and I know that there's a senior center and a, a clinic and all of those kinds of things, which are wonderful, because they haven't left those people behind um, as the market has grown. It's really important. They serve the community. Yeah, I keep the community here, actually. I think yes. That's what makes it Absolutely. If you, uh, do you, can you remember, I mean, here you were out there collecting signatures and you're a part of something. Do you remember when the vote was passed in this market, how, what your response was when you found out that this was successful? Well, I remember that I was very excited to think that I was a part of it, a small part, but um, it's, it was very exciting and I think it, it helped me realize at that age that, that you could make a difference, that you could get out there and, and work for something and succeed. So it was very positive. But again, uh, in the past 25 years, my memories have faded about the particulars involved in that, but it's great. When, where did you live? You said you came down to the market on Saturdays. Where did you live at Well, the I, I lived in the suburbs. I lived out in Burien. Oh, really? So you did come? Yes. We'd come down on the bus, and uh, that was a, really an experience. But um, yes, I live in, in the city now, mm -hmm. in uh, West Seattle. Quite a lot closer. That's a, because oftentimes people think of the market as, as our market, uh, even though they may live quite a distance, but it seems to have a sense of greater Seattle ownership. I can see that, yes. And yet, at the same time, the people who live on the outskirts of the city, I would think would appreciate it more than anyone because one of the things I think about when I come to the market is how real it is. It's not a mall. There's no generic quality to it whatsoever. And, um, and every time you come here, it, it has a different experience in store for you. So um, I'm really always have been excited about that. There's so many places that you go, and I travel quite a lot through the United States, and um, you could be in, in any town. It's just another mall or, you know, everything starts to look the same, but that could never be said for the market. So I think it's important that people from every community enjoy it. Well, thank you. That's a nice way to end our little time together. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank My you pleasure. Very I've never done anything like this before. I don't know how. It must be kind of fun for you.
first two that I did well, this morning. Aren't you putting the mic on? Yeah. I will, but we can. Well, I'm I'll sit with him for a while. Then they can just. All the good stuff I got on this already. Good. All right. Including Mel's snappy answer. <laughs> Association is with Margaret, but I've seen you here a lot. I'm a, I'm a volunteer for the foundation, and so you can give me your history with the market and fill me in. Why have I seen you around the market? Well, the market's just an inter it's interesting place. It's always been that way. When, when I first came here, and the market was physically dangerous from falling down, uh, it was this part of town was the most interesting part of town. I remember at the World's Fair, I was 18 years old, and we'd seen the fair, and we decided to come and check out the um, <coughs> this part of town, because it was exciting. All the neon lights drew us in, just like the movie Paul and I were talking about, Cinderella Liberty, uh, that shows some of the places in the market, and when First Avenue was a real live 24-hour-a-day place, all the way from Belltown, all the way down to uh, Jackson Street, and... Uh, Restaurants and bars and arcades. Peaceful, too. Peaceful. Once in a while, drunks would stumble out of a bar and go at it, but uh, there weren't the dangerous people. There weren't the uh, speed freaks or people doing uh, angel dust. Uh, none of that kind of stuff. Uh, nobody knew what crystal meth was. Uh, oh, those were the days. They were the days. <laughs> and uh, you could... Uh, Flesh Avenue, they called it. Yeah, you could. I mean, First Avenue was called Flesh Avenue. You could safely stand. You could safely stand just a little bit off to the side, so you didn't block traffic and roll a doobie, and nobody would bother you. Uh, we used to go to places like the Mint uh, before it became the Pike Place Bar and Grill, and moved upstairs. After they remodeled the building, it was just a big place down on the lower, on First Avenue, on the street. And you'd go in there at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, get something to eat. At 2 o'clock, uh, they'd close off the bar. Uh, and then there was just, there was just something, all the neon lights, all the sounds of all that. They used to have all these penny arcades for uh, pinballs and stuff. And of course, well, we probably knew that the police were taking their cut and all of that stuff, and uh, gambling was going on. but. It was just a much more interesting, and like now the city is really struggling to try to find ways to bring life back to this part of town. Because it's not as dangerous as it was three or four or five or 10 years ago. But after dark, it's not the friendliest part of town. Uh, in the summer, if I go to a ball game, I don't want to walk up from the dome up to uh, Pike Street to catch a bus up the hill, it's just not it's just not a comfortable thing to do. Whereas before, if the, if the weather wasn't too bad, uh, there was a 50-50 chance you'd run into somebody you knew. S stop and have a beer, maybe uh, play a half hour worth of pinball. Uh, Part of the difference was then and now is that we were young. Well, that's, that's part of it, too. Did you work, ever work down, did you work down at the market? I never worked at the market. I worked, when I first came here, I worked out at uh, Boeing Field. Do you remember the fight to save it? I do remember the fight to save it, because that was interesting. Because <clears throat> there was a hardcore of people, and I was thinking of this the other day, there were young people in those days that were sort of counterculture types, weren't realistic, like you see the punks that hang out up on Broadway today. The guys, that they've just given up on it, and they've just gone in the opposite direction. Well, we thought we could save the world, and we certainly could save something as simple as the Pike Place Market. And <clears throat> um, I remember in those days, I used to own uh, coats and ties, and I could button a shirt around my neck, and uh, I knew all the tricks. I was at the U, and I knew all the tricks about filling up uh, and uh, I could get 
sheet signed is fast. I mean, I didn't care which side of the issue somebody was on. Uh, it helped to know that, so you knew what to tell them to get them to s sign your petition. And uh, but we used to go march up at Dosi's Furniture Store every day. Uh, there was a crowd up there. That store was open. Uh, there was a crowd of people marching in front of Dosi's Furniture Store. Because he sort of became, I think, the focal point. There were other people, uh, certainly the people on the 11th and 12th floor at City Hall, uh, Wes Allman and the people on the council, uh, they wanted a CAT approach, cat as in caterpillar, mm -hmm. knock it down and start over. <laughs> and uh, well, Allman got converted though by that vote. I think he sort of turned. Well, the politicians, the politicians and the people who were the shakers and the movers, suddenly understood that there was a current, and it it had been an undercurrent, but without election it ceased to be the undercurrent and became the main current in the city that uh, the people wanted to do certain things with their city and wanted to direct it in a way that was more, more humane. Uh, because it goes back, if you've read your history book, because I don't think any of us are old enough to remember the days when uh, there were uh, 47 states and the Soviet of Washington. Uh, but, you, but in those days, we knew that we had a couple of allies. We had a couple of allies. If we decided what we wanted to do, we as a community, well, we had Scoop and Maggie, and especially Maggie. And uh, to this day, just like up in Fremont, they had that big statue of Lenin. I think, I think in the middle of Seattle, in a public square somewhere, we ought to have a 50-foot-high statue of Warren G. Magnuson. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know if you need to put God under it. Should it tilt a little bit? <laughs> that doesn't mean it should stand up straight. Because you wonder about guys like you wonder about guys like Swade, and we talk about needs in our community and things we want to do. Well, when we had Warren Magnuson, you talk about what you wanted to do, and. Uh, you go ask him, well, when are you going to do this? He says, it's just not right time for it yet. And then all of a sudden, one day, and you'd read about this in the paper, hear about it in the news, Warren Magnuson would walk onto the floor of the United States Senate and say, oh, by the way, before we vote on this bill, I have one small amendment. <laughs> and he would, just one small amendment, and... Uh, <clears throat> It would be about an 80% vote for the amendment and about an 80% vote for the bill because he'd worked it out. There were always a few people that, because of political considerations, couldn't vote for it. But it was in the days when they compromised and they worked things out. We'd have it worked out, and just the right time, he'd come up and say, okay, let's do it. And uh, it's like the big tankers. We don't see big tankers out here on the inland waters. As I remember, to my dying day, uh, the governor, Dixie Lee Ray, was giving a speech talking about how she wanted tankers on the inland waters, how it would be good for Washington. And people were going around the city, putting the Seattle Times on the newsstand. And the headline says, Senate bans tankers from inland waters. <laughs> and uh, Warren Magnuson has put, put the little bill before the Senate, and uh, from that day forth, uh, it was difficult to get Dixon and Ray to speak to Warren Magnuson. Yeah, didn't he sort of sneak that one through, too? Well, he didn't actually sneak things well, through. Yeah. It was just the way things worked in those days. Because there was a survey. Well, sneak by your description. I mean, it was. Well, true. Yeah, somewhere in around 19, in the early 70s, there was a survey done amongst the, the staffers on Capitol Hill as who to rank the members in their importance and their power. And I can't remember who was number one or who was number two. But one of them was Warren Magnuson and the other was Henry Jackson. And uh, <clears throat> now, well, did Magnuson have anything to do with actually the, the market? The market? Itself, did you know? Well, 
there was he he made no. sure there he made sure there was some federal money available. Just like when we needed the new West Seattle Bridge. Uh, well, the reason we got it is because we needed it. We were ready to do it, and Magnuson was able to get the federal money for it. If we had to redo the market now, there's no way we could do it because we would have difficulty getting that kind of money for a downtown project. And the federal money might amount to uh, 1 or 2 percent max. There's no way that the feds would come across with money. And when we saved the market, <coughs> we were going up against the power brokers and the big shots in the community, except that uh, Magnuson, for some reason, now I know people that know Magnuson. Uh, I only talked to him once or twice. He was a nice guy. But he understood that if he took a wait and see attitude and looked at a situation, he would see which was the appropriate way to go for, for the government. And he waited until the, he allowed the matter to be sorted out. And if he could help sort it out, he certainly would do that. But now, but now there's, there's big time money for big projects. Like look at the struggle we're having trying to get um, money for uh, a baseball stadium or sort out the football stadium. If Maggie was alive, well, like he helped get, he helped with a kingdom. We'd get some help with that. We'd get some help with these projects. If he, he got money for a cricket stadium. <laughs> absolutely right. Before he died, you could drive down Pacific Avenue in front of uh, the Warren G. Magnuson Health Science Center. And uh, it's not common to uh, name things for people when they're still nice. kicking around. <laughs> well, he was but, uh, kicking much. But no, he was, he was still kicking it when they named it after him. He was still in the Senate and still doing his job. And clearly, the Board of Regents, uh, and uh, I don't want to say anything against the market director, uh, but the Board of Regents understood that Maggie had done them more than a great service. You don't see anything named uh, Slade Gordon or, uh, or Brock Adams but or Jim McDermott. Now, now they'll get him back to the market now. And, <laughs> and they're members <laughs> of the market. <laughs> what, do you see, what do you see now? How much time do you spend at the market now? How, uh, much of it, how, how important is it in your life now? Well, well you know, a, there's so much goes on in the market. I know uh, Lee and the people down at the newsstand and uh, uh, Chuck and the Rotary and a few other people in the market. And, and the market's just an interesting place. Uh, with lots going on, you always run into people from uh, here and there around the world. What, 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 go back, what are the memorable, uh, what, what shops did you frequent? Uh, what characters do you remember? Like, for instance, Jack. Did you know the artist? Uh, what was Jack's name? Uh, he, had a, he had a studio, right? Yeah, I know who you mean. I know who yeah, you mean. He had a studio up in the top of the Smith Tower. Yeah, yeah that was before I came to town. And it used to be one of his you murals down there. You know about it, though, because you're sensitive to the history. Because I'm the sensitive to the history about it. And uh, well, well, anyway, Mark, Toby what are some of the, well, Toby the 60s. And Toby, yeah, was, and Toby was before, but uh, I, talked a few time, I talked a few times to Steinbrook about various things around town. Not so much a little bit the market, but more about other things. But um, like when Billy King used to be in the market, Billy, Billy King and a guy I knew, Ron Smethurst, used to work, there used to be the Vitrola Tavern. Oh, God, yeah. And uh, there were two taverns right down under the... Well, the, the Piao, but there were two taverns down uh, at the bottom of Pike just before it went down into Post Alley. And the Vitrola was the more reputable of the two. We'd go over in the other one and watch all the, all the bikers shoot up. What was and the name of the other I cannot for the life of me remember the name of the other. There was the Victrola Tavern. What was the one next to it? It was a tough place. Yeah, it's a uh, bistro. Uh, Bolton's Tavern. The what? The Bolton's ran the tavern. Yeah, but it wasn't Bolton's Tavern. Well, and the, a tough place. But the Victrola next door was... A, yeah, the Victrola next door was an interesting place, and the Pigala was sort of tough at times. And the other taverns in the market, except for the Mint, I used to go, we'd go early in the morning to the Mint, 
and have breakfast and stuff. And there used to be on First Avenue, there'd be the economy quotas that had a thing that was more common in older days. They'd have at the street level, or at the street line, or on the sidewalk, they'd have a little window space that was maybe four or five feet across. And then you'd walk inside of that, and there was a walkway inside of that, and then they had the windows into the store, and the door into the store. And, uh, and there were, and those were probably, those were clothing stores, just like Rogers, that we talked about earlier, was in them, was up at First and uh, Stewart. Uh, but there, cities always had those kind of places in their core for working people, lower income people, place where they shop. Uh, what do you feel about uh, what's happened at First Avenue between the market and Pioneer Square? Well, it's the gentrification. There's a few interesting places. Uh, but on the whole... What's wrong? Is he hitting his head on? I don't know. He's hitting his head on. It's better. Now I just want to... Projecting right at us. So. There you go. Now, what do you think about the changes on First Avenue the between the market and Pioneer Square? The whole thing, it's, I mean, it used to be a 24 hour a day thing. In, in the early and mid morning, uh, all from around, from around 6 o'clock up until around 9 or 10, things were sort of modest, except right around the market, people coming in to set up the market. But, uh, from all 10, 11 o'clock up until 5, 6 in the morning, it used to be happening. All the pinball arcades and all the neon uh, and interesting people. People knew the drunks by name. And uh, when if it, the police or sometimes just somebody in the neighborhood would see the drunks sort of passed out, you'd sort of pick the guy up and sort of drag him out of the way because you knew he wasn't going to be a violent guy that was going to punch you out. Uh, and you knew, you know, people knew to beat cops and, uh, and but it was, it was just a, a magic, it was like a magnet. I mean, there was just so much going on. And it, it sort of symbolized the city. If you look at if you look at movies from the 30s, you see all the neon lights and all the activity. In places like New York or San Francisco or Chicago, well, we had something like that here. And part of that, I think, hate to blame it on the market, but <clears throat> as the market became more spiffed up and physically safer, uh, you know, what was unsafe about it? Oh, you mean in terms of falling yeah, in? Yeah, it was always in danger of falling in. But we were young then, and so... We could have jumped. We could have jumped. <laughs> and uh, we figured when the thing was going to fall, it'd shake a little and give you some... Uh, give you some things. And you knew where the leaks are, so you knew when you were walking and it was wet that you'd sort of detour around where it was going to be too wet to walk. But anyway, you think the market, uh, the, the spiffiness, go ahead. Well, what do you think I about think the spiffiness? Let's get to the point here. What well, about I think what happens is, is I think there's an energy in a community to do development. And the people that couldn't tear down the market and do urban development here needed to do it somewhere else. Uh, Paul Shell got in with Weyerhaeuser and did a, a project uh, just south of the market. They did the watermark, and they, but they rehabbed, because there was pressure on, they did the watermark, but they rehabbed some older buildings. And, uh, mm -hmm. and well, a lot of the old buildings are still there and still provide interesting facades and stuff. Do you think, wait, let me ask a question. Do you think Shell and group, Weyerhaeuser, only saved the old uh, uh, First Avenue facades like the, uh, the Cecil and uh, the, what is it, the, the 
names escape me. Because they were pressured to do that? Do you think they wanted to tear them down? I think they maybe had in mind to preserve those. Well, to some degree, but I, I think part of the reason they had a mind to preserve them well, is tax, I think tax breaks. It, is tax is I well is they understood they understood after 1972 after the vote is they understood the mood of the city and and frankly I think we've demonstrated that the mix of the old and new uh, and around in the market the mix of the old and new if you walk if you walk north on the east side of, of Pike Place, uh, when you go past the Soames Dunn and you come into new construction, if you're on the street, it fits in. Uh, if you go up to, uh, if you go up on the roof next to uh, Bob Wagner's office, uh, where's that? Uh, it's, uh, is it? I think it's in the Soames Dunn. But the, there's a, a roof next to the Soames Dunn. We can get a pretty good view of the park. I was up there when the president was in the park and gave a speech. Because uh, I know Bob a little bit. And some guy said, Bob, let me in. And I was walking through the alley. And I, hey, Bob. And so he uh, allowed me in. And, and, but once you go past there to the next, the next building, the one with uh, Louis and Pike and Western, uh, even though it's a modern building and it's concrete, it sort of fits in. So you think it's a, a, a pretty sensitive uh, melding of the new and the old? I think reasonably so, because let's face it, we're not going to stop the march of the developers. Uh, but we can... On the, other side, on the other side of any vista is a pot of gold, and they're going to go after it, and we can't stop them. What we can do is we can set <coughs> we can set conditions, and there's a wide variety of ways to do that. Like the thing with the warehouser folks, what was it, Cornerstone? Mm -hmm. Shell and the warehouser folks, they sort of understood the mood of the city. So, and like if you look at the if you look at the buildings they saved, they rehabbed them. But if you look at uh, the watermark that they built, well, it fits in. Uh, you go across the street to the federal building. You know, the federal building on First Avenue was going to be one of these magnificent structures of brick. Brick, yeah. But then the concrete, the prefab concrete people came by and turned up their political clout and said, no, nah, let's do it the cheap way with well, prefab. Well, what happened to Magnuson in that moment? I don't know. Maggie just. <laughs> What's the name of that building? Yeah, exactly. And the name of that building is the Henry Jackson. <laughs> Oh no! Did Jackson prefer concrete to brick? Perhaps. No, it got. Jackson I think, was was more frugal, was he? Or well, or, it's not so much that. Running for president that year? No, or what? we just got. It got named the Jackson Building because he up and did us. A, there was one major disservice he did to the people of Washington. He died at a time when they were in a mood to vote a Republican and to take his place. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Milford. Is it anything I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? You have a good memory. No, but remember that uh, it wasn't too long after uh, after the election that uh, the Dosey's Furniture Company went from downtown and retrenched to their store up on Aurora. And uh, it was difficult for the people in Broadmoor and uh, the people in Laurelhurst to... Uh, because it, suddenly the fashion in the city changed. And the kinds of things that the people that wanted to save the market stood for. And frankly, I remember a lot of those people were just anti-establishment type. And uh, the city opened up a lot more after 1972. Where are you going now? Where are you going now? Manu, uh, Joe Martin, where were you when the market was being saved by petition in 1970? Well, I was in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, very far away from that particular battle at that particular time. Uh, I first came to Seattle in 75, 
uh, long after the, the market had been, had been salvaged, but uh, it wasn't too long after that when I became involved uh, in the uh, market neighborhood uh, by way of my work at the First Avenue Service Center where I was a social worker and then uh, became especially involved in the market uh, through the uh, 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 Pike Market Medical Clinic that uh, I was one of the folks who, uh, on board that helped to start that particular facility and we're still here of course. Now as head of the social services staff at the well, I'm, I'm, I'm not the head, but I'm one of the social workers there, and uh, I don't know if we have any head of the, of the staff of social workers, but, uh, but yeah, we're, we're still there, and uh, we're, we are a fully functioning medical facility, and uh, over the years, of course, we've seen uh, thousands of uh, uh, low-income market residents, elderly folks, and other people who live in and around downtown and elsewhere who come to us for medical and social services. Do you recall any... Uh, Fears or emotions of some of the elderly who live downtown in the single room apartments and oh, yeah. hotels had about the market's uh, um, success of staying? Oh, yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, for a great many people, uh, downtown Seattle was uh, an affordable home. It was a, a neighborhood, a place where people resided. Uh, many of the folks whom I met back in the days when I first started working in this community. Uh, were real old-time, long-time downtown Seattle residents. Uh, a lot of them were working uh, men and women, folks who of course were retired by that time, but uh, people uh, uh, who uh, were active participants in the, in the labor wars. Uh, uh, I met quite a few uh, older men who had been members of the uh, IWW, the Wobblies, uh, and, and others who were a part of, of one aspect or another of the, the labor fight, uh, and including many women who are union members. Uh, and uh, preserving the market was a very, very important uh, experience for these folks. Uh, uh, the market was, for many of them, uh, a central kind of hub in their community and in their lives. Uh, the market was a place where people lived and shopped. Uh, it was a place where a great many folks grew up uh, or came of age. And so uh, I think the, the preservation of the Pike Market uh, uh, was uh, a, a truly celebratory event, not only just for that particular community, but certainly for the city as a whole. Uh, and, and, you know, sadly, th you know, throughout downtown, as, as you're aware, uh, uh, we, we weren't able to preserve the the old downtown to the extent that maybe we preserve some of the old market here. Uh, the, the rest of downtown underwent an extraordinary uh, change uh, of uh, gentrification and uh, building demolitions. Uh, In the mid 70s, you betcha, yeah. Some would even say that trend actually began uh, in the late 60s, starting with the Ozark Fire and, mm -hmm. and under the maybe a, a genuine concern to get people out of buildings that weren't particularly safe. It, well, it also was, cleared people out of buildings that, that were maybe a, a, a last resort. A, a building that had violated many, many fire codes for years, yeah. and uh, finally were killing 14. There was quite a few uh, uh, old timers so who died, yeah. then began enforcing fire codes, which made uh, flop houses in the lower level of uh, yeah. single room occupancy hotels uneconomic, and they closed yeah. and boarded up. That happened all over the country, and a lot of people think that this is one of the reasons Well, you know, I, I don't think any, any of us would advocate that it's okay for people to live in substandard housing. However, if the alternative to substandard housing is no housing, mm -hmm. obviously it's better to have some housing than, than nothing. Uh, and that, of course, was one of the things that happened. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, gentr gentrification and uh, uh, building demolition and also a lot of the, 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 the office boom that occurred uh, had a lot of uh, impact. Yeah. Sure. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, it's like there was a, the um, active initiative that took it from there. Yeah. Already initiative and it created suspense. Yeah. Yeah. There's I know. Some good stories along the way. Great, great, great stories, yeah. Yeah. And I do think you should tell the cherry tree. Yeah, the cherry tree. Sure, we can do that. Now, are we turning on? I'm not hearing the microphone. 
Okay. Uh, I, I assume I'm on. So. Oh, are you? Are, are you? How are we doing? Are we doing okay? I, I, I think he turned something off up here, I think. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did you, uh... All right. Are you sure you're not doing Okay. So, things Hello, one, two, how are you? But I'm hearing yeah. you because I'm hearing you. I'm not hearing uh-huh. Through the headphones. Hello, hello, one, two, one, two. Yeah, Testing one, two. Did you turn something off when you left? Hello? One, two, one, two. How's that? How's that? Now is that? Well, well I, I think maybe it's because it's it's not, maybe it's taped on or it was, might, may, maybe, maybe. How's that? Should, should I? I don't think it's that. Okay. So, so, if, if you, okay, so, so if you, uh, all right. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, and I'll. I'll. So. 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 Okay. Just start again, huh? Yeah. I'm Joe Martin, and I'm a social worker with the Pike Market Medical Clinic, and I'm one of the founders of the Pike Market Clinic, uh, which we started in 1978. And, Seven, what does the clinic do? Well, uh, traditionally, the clinic has served. Uh, low-income residents uh, throughout the downtown, but with a special focus on the residents of the Pike Market and, and the surrounding neighborhood. And we've had traditionally a, a special focus on low-income seniors, uh, but I would say probably at this time we are, are broadening our focus so that we include not only seniors, but uh, a lot of different folks. And, the, and, and we have a, a, a uh, provided services to a lot of different individuals and age groups and persuasions uh, over the years that we've been in existence. So, so we're pretty much doing what we've always done. <laughs> what is the um, connection between the fact that there is a clinic in the market and saving the market as a, as a physical structure? Mm -hmm. Well, the the market initiative uh, yeah. included in its language. Uh, uh, a commitment to to keeping social services and low income housing in this part of the city and in the market uh, and I think that was perhaps one uh, component of the initiative that maybe swayed many people to support it in addition to the the overall love of the market people in the city have and had back then uh, but uh, uh, I'm, 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 for one, very, very glad that uh, that that commitment was there because, in the course of my work uh, uh, over the last 18 years uh, uh, in uh, the Pike Market uh, at at the clinic, I've uh, seen thousands and thousands of people, uh, many who of whom are longtime uh, market and downtown residents who who sorely needed the services we provided. So I'm. Thankful we're there. Yeah. What are the typical services that you? What is a day? What's a day in the clinic like? That might be a good way to mm -hmm. Typical day in the clinic. You can tell them well, uh, a typical day would uh, mean that uh, our medical staff would see uh, upwards of maybe uh, uh, three dozen individuals uh, from. Uh, 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 individuals who might be homeless and who had nowhere to stay the night before to individuals who are low-income elderly and who might reside in one of the low-income housing facilities uh, in the downtown area. Uh, we might see uh, someone from the Pike Market who's a uh, low-income working person who might have gotten hurt on the job or who might simply be a, a, a long-time patient of ours and who's coming in that particular day to see their physician or the nurse. Uh, so we are in operation much like any other uh, urban clinic that would serve a low-income clientele would be in operation. Uh, 
uh, we have people who come in for their appointments. We also have people who come in on a walk-in basis, and we have the occasional emergency. Um, I think I can honestly say we are seeing increasing numbers of homeless and, and jobless people, folks who are in truly desperate circumstances. Um, the work that I do as a social worker, I encounter uh, a wide array of folks who need various kinds of social services, be it uh, assistance with um, uh, welfare help or social security or veterans problems or Medicare, Medicaid, uh, uh, individuals who might need a referral to a dentist or to alcohol treatment or mental health treatment. Uh, uh, I encounter a wide array of needs. So uh, a typical day is uh, usually pretty full of a lot of different people with a lot of different issues that they bring to us. Where did the medical staff come from as part of, of the clinic? Is this a full-time situation, mm -hmm. medical staff, yeah. or are there people that come and go at a part-time basis, maybe you know, physicians that have a certain day here but are otherwise at Providence? Right. No, we, our, our medical staff is uh, uh, comprised of uh, three uh, uh, physicians who are employees of our clinic. Uh, two, I believe, are full-time, one is part-time, and we are soon to uh, bring on board one more part-time physician. And these four doctors are employees of the Pike Market Clinic, and their practice is the Pike Market Clinic. They don't have an office or a practice elsewhere. Uh, and uh, the physicians are, well, we've had two of our docs there for uh, well over 10 years, and that has provided a tremendous continuity of care and, and commitment to our population. Um, so we, well, we also have physicians who are uh, 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 there maybe a half day a week, and they're, they're affiliated with Virginia Mason. Uh, we have a couple of docs who, who do fill-in work and who are fairly consistently available when we need a, a substitute doctor. And we have one uh, part-time psychiatrist as well uh, who practices elsewhere in addition to the clinic. But we have a pretty solid and comprehensive uh, array of committed physicians. And we have a terrific staff of registered nurses who I think are as as good as you'll find in any medical facility in the city. Have you always been in the same location? Well, interestingly, that you, interestingly enough, we, we were not always in the same location. <laughs> uh, we started out uh, at the old uh, Motherlode Tavern, which uh, for years was known as Johnson's Tavern, but in its latter incarnation was known as the Motherlode Tavern. And I remember the Motherlode when it was a functioning tavern. Uh, but it seems to have closed its doors sometimes in, sometime in 77. And so this space, which was on, the, I think it was 1607 First Avenue was the address. Uh, you had this space available there, and the location that we have been in for uh, many years now on Post Alley, 1930 Post Alley, that location was supposed to have been ready for us to commence our work in the fall of 1978. Now, things being what they often are with those kinds of projects, uh, it wasn't ready, the space wasn't ready, but people in the community and the folks who are ready to start the clinic operation were prepared to initiate something if we, if we could find a space. So the uh, Motherlode Tavern uh, was transformed into a functioning uh, storefront uh, clinic for this neighborhood. And at that time, we also shared that space with the Pike Market Senior Center. So it was a real interesting period for the clinic and the senior center sharing the space and, and us trying to do our, uh, our clinic uh, work. Uh, the old men's room of the tavern was transformed into a laboratory. And uh, uh, so you can imagine the ambiance. It was pretty, pretty funky de decor, yeah. But uh, we, we eventually moved into our permanent location on the alley, in, in Post Alley, 1930 Post Alley, in November of 79. And we've been in that space ever since. And we have since expanded uh, uh, into other parts of that general space. Uh, 
since the original uh, occup occupancy in, in November of 79, and we've also now an, uh, an annex, a satellite clinic down on Western Avenue. So, so we've grown and our staff has increased. Uh, I think I can honestly say that the original spirit and community-mindedness of the clinic is still very much intact, and I think people, by and large, who are currently involved with the clinic still have a strong commitment to make the community spirit that has been our, our tradition at the clinic uh, an ever-present one. Uh, we get funding from uh, block grant through the city, uh, various grant sources that our, our director and, and, and fundraisers uh, have to work to get. And because we're a medical facility, we can also bill Medicare and Medicaid. But because we are a private nonprofit, we do depend a great deal on the uh, donations and grant sources to, to keep us going. Well, I think uh, I th an, a great many people that I encounter and have encountered over the, over the years who, who wind up coming to us, whether it's again for a medical problem or a social problem, or perhaps they're not even sure what their problem is, but they come to us, uh, a great many people are individuals who seem to have nowhere else to go. A lot of the people who live downtown uh, don't 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 have a lot of family. Um, uh, a lot of folks don't have a lot of connections. Uh, uh, certainly, the homeless and those who are struggling uh, economically, uh, in my experience, by and large, don't don't have a, a big community of support in their lives. I suppose if they did, they would maybe wouldn't get to that point where they would be on the streets, but. Uh, uh, I've encountered a great many um, people who are alone. They really are alone. And the, the clinic, in addition to providing the support and the services and the medical uh, care and TLC that we offer folks, uh, uh, we, 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 we do provide this kind of a, I mean, I, I, we become a friend to a lot of folks who are not, uh, 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 rich in friends. We provide, uh, some t in, in some instances, we become a kind of surrogate family for a great many folks. <clears throat> so I think I can honestly say if we weren't there, I think there'd be a big hole in the social fabric of this community and throughout downtown. Um, I think we've been able to fill uh, uh, a, big, uh, a big hole in a lot of people's lives that otherwise might not have been filled. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, one of our social workers does home visits, uh, and and I am mostly at the clinic most of the time. But if somebody needs a home visit, or if I need to go out to where they are, I, I'll I'll do that, so that we we have that means of of, uh, of of providing those home visits. We also have a nurse who is a community health nurse who actually does visit people in their home. So so we do provide that kind of outreach service to the community. You've been here a long time, I mean, really. I mean, yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. Some of you from the beginning. Any stories or memories that you have specifically that would be fun sure. to tell about that you could share with me? <laughs> well, sure. Uh, well, Mar Marlis Erickson suggested maybe I tell uh, the cherry tree story. Uh, uh, the, 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 the big lot that is north of Virginia Street that is, uh, is sort of cordoned off by Virginia Street and First Avenue. Uh, that used to be known as Harbor Heights uh, back in the old days, and a great many people resided in and around the, the old buildings and, and rooming houses that comprise that part of the First Avenue scene. And uh, in the course of a lot of the changes and shifts, and, and I suppose from the market renovation as well, uh, that whole block was, was raised. Uh, and uh, for a great many years, 
a parking lot was there, just a dirt parking lot, but when the buildings were all cleared, lo and behold, in the middle of it, there was this beautiful old cherry tree that must have been there for God knows how long. I mean, it was an old tree. It was a big old tree, and uh, so it must have been there at least 100 years or more. I don't know how many cherry trees there were 200 years ago in this rugged community that would have been out, been out here, but the cherry tree was there probably 100 years. And um, to, to some degree, I think a lot of us felt the cherry tree, you know, the buildings were gone, the people had been, you know, moved out, and some no doubt became homeless, and others hopefully found some housing. But that, that shift would have gone on sometime in the mid-70s, but this old tree was there. And you know, a lot of us grew very attached to this old tree and kind of felt in some ways it was symbolic of this old community that was still down here. And, uh, but you know, sure enough, uh, uh, you know, the forces of development and so forth were, were hard at work in that block not too long thereafter, and the cherry tree was slated for demolition. So uh, a few folks uh, snuck in to the, to the lot. It was all fenced off, of course, but a few folks snuck in the, the night before uh, the uh, date for the tree's uh, deracination was scheduled, and uh, it, it's true the, the tree with, with red and white and blue bunting and, and, uh, and you know, decorating kind of brought attention to not only the tree but just to the, the changes downtown and to the, to, to the kind of symbolism that this represented that uh, uh, a, a very rugged and, and, and important, we felt, an uh, older community was, was, was like, like this tree also being kind of dug out and, and dis displaced by the, the, the forces of development. And we um, simply brought attention to this and had a little demonstration and they cut the tree down in, in spite of our efforts. But, uh, 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 but, it, but it was, you know, something, one of the things we, we engaged in. I mean, over the years, um, uh, I can name off lots of incredible people, uh, folks that you would, you know, people like uh, Bill McKay, who was a great uh, uh, supporter of the clinic and, and who was uh, uh, very involved in the labor movement. He had been a union organizer back in the days when it was, that was a dangerous profession. Uh, people like Joe Gannon, who was a, a, a wonderful, self-educated, tough old sailor of the old school. And uh, I mean, there's all kinds of folks. Uh, Al Chisholm, who is still with us here in the market, who is the last surviving African American member of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, the uh, brigade that went over before World War II to fight fascism in Europe. I mean, Al still lives here in the market. Uh, individuals like this, who I've met here, very, very special and uh, colorful people, but uh, genuinely human and, and uh, important. With a, with, a, with, a, with a profound sense of history and their place in the world. Uh, meeting them and being their friend and, and comrade down here has meant a great deal to me. Um, and I continue to meet all kinds of interesting folks. The world is changing. Um, uh, uh, a lot of the older generation is, is now either gone or they're, they're not uh, probably going to be around that much longer, and, and, uh, uh, and yet the needs uh, are certainly not going away. The, uh, if anything, uh, homelessness, uh, the need for medical care, uh, the need for uh, social services to assist people in, in, in crisis, uh, I see these needs increasing, and uh, it certainly has me profoundly concerned because, sadly, I don't see uh, any kind of coherent uh, response to these uh, needs that are continuing to uh, present themselves at our clinic. We, we are, of course, doing what we can, and I think we do a good job, but the broader, the broader picture at this time does not look terribly promising, but I have a lot of hope, too. Sure. Well, I, I think the market People were fortunately able to see clearly that the market was a precious resource. At the same time, there were other very powerful people in the city who felt the market was an expendable, trashy piece of history that should be 
demolished and paved over and forgotten. And uh, thank, f you know, thank God for Victor Steinbrook and, and all of the wonderful good people who saw in this very unique, funky neighborhood that is the Pike Market. They saw beyond the shallow, superficial, uh, greed-ridden arguments of the opponents of the market at that time. And their, their vision, I think, has proved correct, that the market is a special p place. Uh, people from all over the world, when they're in Seattle, come to the Pike Market because it is a special place. It's a place where people can feel human. You can walk with lots of other people, and there are vendors selling food, and there are people selling crafts, and there are folks in the restaurants and pubs and bars offering their wares, and it's a very human uh, place. And I wish today we could all see how that vision needs to be applied throughout our city, uh, perhaps throughout our country and our world. Uh, that uh, uh, and, and, and the for those, those same forces of greed and development and displacement that almost destroyed the market are at work throughout the downtown, elsewhere, outside the market. They are certainly at work throughout the city, uh, and they are displacing old communities, and they are making the lives of poor people and elderly people and folks who are not able to simply relocate elsewhere. They're making their lives very difficult if not damned impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a mistake we have uh, 5,000 or more homeless people in this city. Uh, I guess I'd like to see the, the spirit that preserved the Pike Market in the early 70s uh, be roused to today to preserve the low-income housing and uh, affordable units of, of, of uh, housing that low-income people and low-income working people and elderly people who don't have a lot of money depend on uh, so that those units of housing can also be saved as the market was saved. Um, I think if we don't do it, we are going to witness ever-increasing forms of social dislocation and suffering, and there's no need for it. That's right. That they wouldn't even have told their physician, had an experience it where they were shy. And she gave me this quotation. I've never forgotten this. It was one of my favorite quotations. She says, you know, she says, it's hard to be uptight with someone's misogyny. That's right. And I just love it. That's I, right. I think I titled a whole lot of yeah. one line of, of that. But I thought it's a special kind of cure because we, everybody is sometimes shy, but particularly somebody who's been dislocated and homeless. Mm -hmm. That's right. What their needs are. That's right. To get through to them, to give them the kind of medical attention. It's much different than somebody who has, you know, their standard checkup or their physician at three years from now. That's right. It might be at a much different level. Yeah. It, and and uh, as you say, a lot of people uh, will will tell me as a social worker stuff that they didn't tell the doctor. I mean, they didn't want to bother the doctor. Or and I, and I said, what do you mean? The doctor is here to be bothered, you know, and, and you have this problem and you didn't tell the doctor. Um, and it, it uh, yeah, and, and as you say, you compound that maybe with a lack of education or, or a lack of, of, of comfort talking on the phone or whatever. Yeah, it's precisely. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Well, that's wonderful. I enjoyed well, it. Well, thank you. I enjoyed doing Great. it. Yeah. Great. Well, I guess you can so I'll, I'll un unplug. <laughs> Isn't that nice? <laughs> My goodness. Find that piece of cake. And so you, you, uh, you sing or play music or what? Yeah. At Kells? Yeah. At Kells, like
too. We've been doing it the last couple of years to the Plymouth Festival. We were working with it. Um, I think it's been 20 years. Yeah. Oh, it's really interesting. Yeah. That too. Well, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful it's tradition. It. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. Well, it doesn't hurt you that you look your part. Well, well, well <laughs> thank you. Yeah, well, well my, one of my relatives wrote, wrote the Irish National Anthem. Really? And, uh, yep. Oh, my and, gosh. And, uh, That's terrific. And this is in regards to the video history of the 1971 Save the Market Initiative, which of course is an oral history of video that we're doing. We're interviewing people who have uh, recollections of the Pike Place Market uh, during that initiative process 25 mm -hmm. years ago and some of their earlier recollections of the market, and particularly uh, some of their uh, relationships with the vendors that they may have gone to or some of their association with some of the business people that they recall who may or may not still be here. So, uh, Keith, um, were you here in the 1950s and 60s and 70s? Well, I was born in Seattle in 1957. Uh-huh. Yeah, I haven't left. Uh -huh. So I was here starting in 57. Great. Yeah, I remember my first visit to the market probably the mid-60s which was like during the Vietnam War protests and the hippie movement. And I was um, fourth or fifth grade. And we came down one weekend with my parents, my two older brothers, and roamed around. Uh -huh. And since that day, I've always enjoyed coming to the market. I see. Uh, were you aware of the, uh, that the urban developers were going to change the character of the market? Well, I, um, I don't know how aware I was. I do remember watching the news, and I was always interested in politics, and every night watch the news and stuff. I, I heard about the proposed demolition of the market and the rehab, and when I heard about the campaign for the signatures, I told my father I wanted to get involved. He came down to the market, got uh, some empty petition, and I started going door to door in my neighborhood over in the Alki area, and then I decided to go to school and ask all the teachers if they would sign. Um, the principal and the teachers 
sat down with me and we talked about it for quite a bit. Because they wanted to make sure I knew what the heck I was talking about. Yeah. And they, I convinced them that I really did understand what the, uh, what they were trying to do with the market and what the concept of the petition was for. Right. And I spent one of my lunch hours standing in the office of my grade school, which that year was Fairmont Park. And I got all the signatures from the uh, principal, janitors, teachers, um, secretaries, anybody that was over 21. At that time, you had to be 21 to vote. Uh -huh. As a sixth grader, I couldn't sign it. But I think I filled three or four uh, 20 names per um, petition. petition. Yeah. So maybe I did, what, 10 cents worth or whatever, but we got it on the ballot. We sure did. Well, that's great. Uh, do you, uh, you know, during that time, in, during the, the process, did you visit the market and get uh, kind of a feeling of what we were about to lose? You know, what well, actually was, what was it's, that it's, it's hard for me really to say that I had a feeling of what, because I realized that when you tear a building down, you lose that building. So I understood that. Mm -hmm. I understood that when I came down here with my parents, I enjoyed it. Even though we didn't shop a lot, I think it was more of a, in the winter time, we would come down here, you would have the views all over the harbor, and. It was just a fun place to be. I remember one of my first memories was walking down on the second or third floor, and there was a shop there that sold World War II items, like um, the Nazi flags and the armbands. And these were the real things. Huh. I was fascinated by that. And years later, I would wind up getting a history degree at the University of Washington. So maybe when I was that age, I was just so fascinated with history that not knowing it, I was drawn to the market because it, the market was built the year uh, my grandmother was born. And she moved to Seattle, and here I am today. So How wonderful. There is a kind of strange tie-ins. but Well, there's a generational connection. Yeah. Yes. And I remember um, talking to my mother over the years about the market when it would be in the news and stuff. And she told me that as she grew up in Seattle too, and, and they would come down and shop. Uh -huh. And we do have some pictures go going buried somewhere in our home somewhere. I remember seeing my grandmother here at the market, like uh, before the World War II or during the World War II, that time frame. Wonderful. So there are three or four generations of my family that uh, have come down here. Yeah, um, do you recall outside of the shop where all of this memorabilia from the World War, War yeah. sparked your interest? Do you remember other shops or shop offerings? I remember um, in the 60s they had um, black lights were the big thing. I remember a poster shop down there, uh -huh. full of, of some of the strangest. I, I mean, today you wouldn't find it strange, but as a sixth grader, it really caught my eye. I remember spending a lot of time just looking at the posters. There were numerous antique shops uh -huh. that I would go in and, and look at things and. There were uh, stamp collecting and a, a shop, I think it's still there today. It's, they sell uh, stamps and coins and they also had the old campaign buttons, uh -huh. which I collected as a kid, old seafarer buttons, old um, uh, sports items, memorabilia items. Uh, if you were to find your just uh, save and sign pin, would you be at all reluctant to have us at least uh, get a picture of the pen or? Well, if I could find it, um, I couldn't guarantee I could find it. Yeah. <laughs> but I, um, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't mind you taking a picture of it. I want to keep it though. Yeah. I remember um, my father 
about that piano. My father was so impressed with my efforts. And I collected pins um, as a kid. That he came home after delivering the completed petition with this button that says here. And I put it on my wall. I think it was on the wall for 15 years until I redesigned my bed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so your interest in history was sparked by your visiting these shops here oh, that oh yeah. had a variety of memorabilia that kind of linked your interest in history. Mm -hmm. And then since then, you have mentioned that you had an academic career with a major in history. A major at the University of Washington. Yeah, and what, in American history or North Well, history? I took mostly American and Western European. Uh-huh. And there was one class uh, they taught at the time about Canadian history. They taught one class, and I took it. Uh -huh. Half my family is from Canada, and I, I see. was interested in that, and so I took it. It was most exciting. Yeah. Huh. Uh, so, do you have any anecdotes or stories about the market that are particularly... Well, I could tell you, you know, once I got older, and started going to the University of Washington. I rode the bus between my home and Alki and out to the university. And as everyone knows that spends time on the bus, you don't make connections all that easy. And this was in the late 70s. And I was roaming around downtown killing time. And I found myself spending a lot more time down here at the market. Because at that time, they started the major rehab of the area where the stalls are. Mm -hmm. And I would come down and watch the workmen um, rebuilding it. And the interesting thing is, we fought to save the market, but if you come down today, the only thing left are the big concrete pillars that uh, are along the um, stand stalls of the uh, farmers and the merchants. All the roof, and though it looks exactly the same, all that roof was rotten and falling apart. They ripped it all off and completely replaced it. And um, I remember being fascinated by um, the brick, the, the street that runs from first along the stalls, so it was all brick. And I came down and watched how they put, laid the brick and washed, they had to wash off the extra motor and so forth. Great. And the first thing, uh, when I finally got a job, I was making a little bit of money, I joined the Market Foundation, sent them $50. Uh -huh. And then they said, well, we're going to refloor the uh, walkway around the stalls with names. And the first real donation I ever gave to anybody was to write a check for $35 and have my name forever engraved on the walkway. And I, I remember talking about it with my parents, and my mom went ahead and had her parents, who at that time had both died, named, engraved, placed on the walkway. So I'm very proud. I walked through here and I looked for that. Sure. So you have three generations of family that have been that here. Have used the market. Yeah. And enjoyed the market. Shopped here and gotten their food here off and on, and mm -hmm. the market's given your family from generations uh, a lot of, uh, of joy, as well as uh, uh, entertainment, and, and mm -hmm. uh, so there was a certain value that you found in, in coming down here, and how you estimate that value is, is hard to determine, oh, so yes. I'm glad that but maybe, you know, sometimes just walking around and being alone, thinking about your thoughts, and the market's a great place to, there are areas where you can come and stand and watch the ferry boats or the, the traffic, or you could go have uh, something to eat, and some of these restaurants are unique. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, well, I think that we will conclude this interview number of 91269 dash 17 on camera A, 
And thank you, Keith. Well, thank you. And we will look forward to. I hope to see the finished film someday. You will. <laughs>